blessing. As I hear that song this morning, it reminds me that there's some times in my life when I wasn't as faithful and as consistent as I needed to be. But every time I look around, he kept on blessing me in spite of myself. Do I have about a hundred of y'all that can stand up on your feet and say, God, you keep blessing me. I don't have to wait till Thanksgiving and give him thanks for what he's done for me. Every day is a... Would you look at somebody beside you and say, obviously you don't know what the Lord has done for me. So can y'all tell your neighbor one thing that the Lord has done for you? How he blessed you, how he kept you, how he delivered you, how he healed you, how he... Come on, somebody, look at your neighbor and tell them one thing that the Lord has done. Put one thing in the chat real quick on what the Lord has done for you. And now I want you to take 10 seconds and give God the best praise you got for how he brought you through the whole year. You made it to November. You got one month left, and God has been providing for you over and over and over. Can somebody take a little time and tell God thank you? Touch three people and tell me, keep blessing me. He keeps blessing me. He... Y'all better act like you know. I just need somebody that, that, that had more money this week than you did last week to make some noise. I, I, I need somebody that didn't think you were going to make it through the year, but God kept you. I need you to make some noise. Huh? My, 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 my. Grab somebody's hand where you're standing. Father, we thank you right now for your Holy Spirit that is in this room right now. We don't come here to be seen. We came here to see you. We came, God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit this morning. And, God, we just want to say thank you that we made it into the sanctuary. We feel your presence in here this morning. We didn't come for any other reason but to come and be in the presence of you, God. But in the, in the, when the, in the, where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom, there's healing, there's deliverance. God, I pray that you would hide me behind Calvary's cross that somebody might see Jesus. I am the clay, you're the potter. Take me, make me, mold me, shape me, use me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. God, I reach out and grab somebody's hand, and I touch and agree with them right now that whatever they stand in need of, Father God, your hand shall supply. I squeeze healing into their hand right now in the name of Jesus. For everything they might have came in with, God, they're not leaving with it. God, we can be changed in Jesus' name. So, God, God, I pray right now that you show up and you show out and have your way online and in this house so that we can leave knowing that we've been in the presence of the Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah and amen. Clap your hands if you love the Lord this morning. Look at somebody beside you. I'm so glad you made it. Listen, do me a favor. Share this stream. You got some cousins and stuff that's home. They're trying to get their greens ready for Thanksgiving. And they didn't get to make it to church this morning. So would you do me a favor and be a good uh, electronic evangelist and share this stream right now. Go to the New Direction Christian Church Facebook page and share. Amen. Amen. And I'm excited, y'all, this coming week. Um, can y'all believe it's November already? Now, not only is it Thanksgiving this week, and I hope y'all got your greens. I went to Super Low with Rhonda yesterday and got our, uh, in addition to what we already grew ourselves, and I'm, I'm excited about that. My stomach it says yes. Uh, but also, we got the, a Christmas tree lighting this coming Friday. Is it Friday? November 29th? Yes. And so, Commissioner Miska Bibbs, wave your hand, Commissioner. Good to see you. Give it up for our Commissioner, Commissioner Miska Bibbs. So, she, she thought it not robbery to bring a giant Christmas tree right here on our parking lot, November 29th. We're going to light up the Christmas tree for all of Hickory Hill. Amen. Put your hands together for Commissioner Bibbs. So how many of y'all can sing Christmas carols? Can y'all sing? Anybody? Erica, can you sing a little bit? A little bit? Me too. I sang solo. Solo, you can't hear me. So I want you. I want y'all to come this coming Friday, and at 2 o'clock, we're going to gather and, and rehearse our Christmas carols and whatnot. And then at 4 o'clock, we're going to light the Christmas tree. Look at your neighbor and say, 4 o'clock, November 29th, we're lighting up our Christmas tree. I tried to get Rhonda to let me put mine up, Dennis, for Thanksgiving. She said, no, baby, one holiday at a time. So we're going to light up our Christmas tree on November 29th. Y'all with me? All right, there's a word from the Lord. Y'all, didn't that young lady preach good last Sunday? Huh? 
Pastor Stella Hollis, the lady in red. I was so proud of her. It, it's always good to hear from our elder statesmen, especially in times of chaos. And it just felt like me listening to uh, my grandmama tell me, baby, everything's going to be all right. So can we once again put our hands together for our elder, Pastor Stella Hollis. Thank you so much. Look at your neighbor and say, there's a word from the Lord. All you young people whose ankles are good and you didn't have to get a quarter zone shot in them, stand up. Young people, y'all stand up with me this morning in honor of the word of God. Let's stand up. Y'all, I'm, I'm getting old because I had to go get one of them shots this week. I, I, I was trying to be a big boy. And the thing that made me a man up was my wife has to get 32 migraine shots. You know, and so I had one little shot. You should have seen me. I was like the. But I'm standing here today because the Lord made a way. Amen. So let's stand for the word of God. The gospel according to John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, reading from the New Living Translation. And the word of God reads this way. After this, somebody say after this. Jesus crossed over to the far side of the sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd, a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Look at somebody beside you and say, why are you following Jesus? Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover festival and soon Jesus saw a huge crowd of people coming toward him. And turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip for he already knew. Somebody say he already knew. He already knew what he was going to do. He was just testing Philip. And Philip replied, even if we worked for eight months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed all these people. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, there's a young boy here with his lunch. He got five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with such a huge crowd? Jesus said, tell everybody to sit down. Look at your neighbor and say, sit down somewhere. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000, not counting the women and children. And then Jesus took the loaves from the little boy, gave thanks to God, and distributed to the people that were sitting down. I need you to catch this. He distributed to who? That were sitting down. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to be present to win. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate. Oh, my God, y'all ain't going to get with me today. And they all ate as much as they wanted, and everyone was full. Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers. <coughs> get the rentals wrapped so that nothing is wasted. And so they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the barley loaves. And when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed one to another, surely he's the prophet we've been expecting. Look at somebody say, I've been waiting on this. What I'd like to talk to y'all about this morning is thank God for leftovers. Don't they be good? <laughs> Shake your neighbor's hand and say, thank God for leftovers. You may be seated. The Bible says that the Passover was near when Jesus gathered with his disciples. And the Passover is similar to our Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, look at your neighbor and say, Thanksgiving is near. Oh, there's something there's some about Thanksgiving, ain't it? It's the precursor to everything else. It's time for families to come together. And I never will forget growing up in school. Do y'all remember that little picture that always reminded us of Thanksgiving in school? Do you, can somebody describe the picture of thank, the first Thanksgiving? What was it? Pilgrim. Let's be PC. Native American. Pilgrim. What are they doing? They're eating together. Is that the picture you remember? 
What would you do if I told you that there was a myth? That there was a, there was propaganda. That these Wamaponga Native Americans were happily sitting at the table with pilgrims who had invaded their land. The reality is that in around 1621, during this first Thanksgiving meal, the reason that the Wamaponga was setting with these European settlers was not because they were friendly and docile. It was for political reasons. It's because Wamaponga realized that if they did not learn how to work with these Europeans who had come and brought disease and weapons, that they would make slaves of them as they had done so already. So the chief of the Wamapongas came and approached them after, after being wary for a season that he thought it would be politically correct to come and sit with them because after all they needed some help with an enemy tribe that was attacking them. So the dinner that you saw as a kid was not because of these docile Indians, Native Americans who are coming around the table saying please be our friends. It was them setting up a political strategy for survival. And so this first Thanksgiving meal was out of political survival rather than tribal people being docile and helpless. The relationship was political rather than being based on interpersonal relationships with the Wamaponga hoping an alliance with the settlers would allow them access to trade and help them fight against their enemies. The Passover feast was much like the Thanksgiving feast as, as well as the Passover was to the Palestinian Jews what the 4th of July is to Americans. It was a rallying point for intense nationalistic zeal. Israel was awaiting their Messiah to come back. They were waiting for, for a Messiah to come back and make Israel great again. I said they were awaiting a Messiah much like King David to come back against Roman occupation. They had been oppressed, they were politically powerless, and they were waiting for a leader who represented their self-interest to come, and thusly, that is why they wanted to make Jesus their king. But what you need to understand is that Jesus wasn't that kind of king. Jesus was not about to be forced into somebody's political pigeonhole. He was not to be manipulated because of his gifts that God had given him. He was there for a whole nother reason. It was not for politics. Are y'all listening to me? The people of Israel had been under Roman occupation. They were hungry for a king and they wanted Israel to be great again like it was under King David. But watch this. When Jesus gets to this hill country and they get ready to they're trying to prepare for the Passover feast. He can't get to where he's going because there's a crowd following him. Somebody say a crowd. He looks up Erica and he sees a crowd of people. And I said, why are these crowd of people following him? And as I studied the text, Pastor Stella, what I discovered was is that Jesus had been healing many people. And they were following him. Watch this because of the miraculous sign. They were following him because of the power that exuded out of his person. They were following him because of all the transformation they had experienced through his miracles. Listen to me. I was able to go with my wife on date night Friday. We went to go see a movie called Gladiator 2 with Denzel Washington. It is an interesting movie that really is a parable of what's going on in America right now. The empire is on the verge of crumbling. There are two corrupt emperors that are twin brothers that are in power. And I keep asking myself all through the movie, how is it that all of these people are following these corrupt leaders? And then Denzel's character helped me. He said, politics follows power. So all of these people are following these corrupt politicians because they want proximity to power to the point where they even, watch this, suppress their own values of what they know to be right. But in this text, we see Jesus following, people following Jesus because they also wanted proximity to power, but where they messed up is when they tried to shift it into politics. All of us initially start following Jesus. Good God, help me preach this. Many of us start following Jesus out of the innocence because of the miracles he worked on our life. But where we get messed up is when we pollute the power of Jesus by trying to manipulate it into politics and our proximity to power to the point we water down why he came in the first place. 
he's at this hill not because of politics. He's at this hill because he's establishing the kingdom of God. Why do we follow Jesus? Look at your neighbor and say, why do you follow Jesus? When we look at this story, we, we see a great crowd that has followed him to a hill country. They've listened to him teach. They've seen him perform healing miracles, and they've been there all day. It makes you wonder, why do crowds follow Jesus? Mike, can you let this down a little bit? Why do crowds follow? Look at somebody and say, why do crowds follow Jesus? Some people come and follow Jesus because they want fire insurance. Just in case God is real, I don't want to go to hell. Some people follow Jesus because out of tradition. You came to church because that's what you're supposed to do on Sunday. Keep it real. Some of y'all follow Jesus because of what he can do for you. Can you ask yourself this question honestly? Why do I follow Jesus? Is it because of dead tradition? Is it because of what I can get out of it? Or is it because of who he is? I praise you because of who you are. Jesus later on would say to his disciples, to many of those people that were following him in the crowd, he says, some of y'all are only following me because of the bread. How many of y'all can say, if he don't do nothing else? Rodney, can you look back over your life and see how God has been with you and he's done so much that if he don't do nothing else, there's nothing that can happen in my life to ever make me stop believing in Jesus Christ. He's already done enough. Can I get 10 of y'all to raise your hand and say, if he don't do nothing else, he saved my soul. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm going to live eternally with God forever. And if he don't do nothing else, I'm still going to give him glory. Why do you follow? Jesus is it because of the bread or because he is the bread Jesus said I am the bread of life and he who eats of me will never hunger again man cannot live by, by, by bread alone but by every word that was proceeded out of the mouth of God who is the bread Jesus is the bread in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was with God and everything that was made was made through him and the word became flesh and lived amongst us but why do you follow Jesus? Because he pays your rent? Why do you follow Jesus? Well, some of y'all come to church up until you get a job. When, 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 you, when you were broke, busted and disgusted, you were the first one at church. Now your money is doing so good, church becomes an option. Why do we follow Jesus? They follow him because they saw his miracles. Jesus was always cleared off. He didn't come to be that kind of king. He didn't come to be an earthly king. Look at what he told Pilate right before they would crucify him over some political lies. John 18, 36 says, Jesus says, my kingdom doesn't consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that kind of king and not the world's kind of king. Can I help y'all? America keeps trying to make kings out of men. And we have exchanged the king of kings for a king of liars. Because we have shifted from following Jesus to making a king out of a man that doesn't even have the integrity to be a man. All right, let me go keep on moving, y'all. My second point to y'all is this. The food crisis is just a test of our faith. Jesus had a crisis. Can y'all still awake? Can anybody tell me what the crisis was in this text? I just want to see if you're paying attention. What was the crisis? They had about 10,000 people. Y'all always call this miracle what? The feeding of the... Your math is off. Your math ain't math. The Bible says there were about 5,000 men. Men, men during those times were married to men and women who married tend to have 
No birth control back then. Thank you, Pastor Stella. So if you got 5,000 men, 5,000 women, and some children, two and a half kids, somebody do the math for me real quick. How many people is that? About 20,000 people that need to eat. And they don't have a grocery store. They don't have any lunch. They've been with Jesus all day. He's been performing miracles. He's tired. He's hungry. His feet hurt. And he goes to sit down on the hill, looks up, and he's got about 20,000 people just looking at him like, we hungry. And he looks at his disciples. Dennis, he asks a good question. He says to Philip, Philip, where are we going to get all this food? We're going to get enough food to feed all these people. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Philip looks and sees the same thing Jesus says, sees, and he says this. He says, even if we work for eight months, even if we work for eight months, Greg, we would not have enough food to feed 20,000 people. Make them go home. Have you ever been in a situation where you had more needs than you had resources? Have you ever been in a place, Ursula, where if God didn't show up, it wasn't going to get done? And many of y'all are looking at your current economic situation and you're thinking, we need a king that's going to help us bring the cost of eggs and bread down. Many people went into the voting booth because they believed the narrative that the food was high because of the current administration. But what people don't understand is, is that if the new administration gets his way and raise tariffs on foreign countries, those foreign countries will raise their prices. If this new administration gets his way as king of America, he's going to deport all those brown people that voted for him that are hired for cheap labor, and now the corporations are going to have to raise their prices because they had to pay you and other people to do the job, and now it's going to be reflected in your groceries. So making a king is not going to solve this current crisis. What's going to, what's going to help me in this crisis is which king I decide to talk to. The Bible says that Jesus asked Philip, what are we going to do? Not because he didn't know, because watch this, Mo. He said he already had a plan. He just wanted to see what you was going to do. Oh, I feel like preaching. Let me come down here. Y'all acting funny today. Y'all just acting real funny. I said, you trying to, while you trying to figure it out, God has already worked it out. I'm talking to some people right now. You're in a situation where you don't know how you're going to pay your bills. You don't know how you're going to pay them taxes. You don't know how you're going to get out of this rut. And God says, I just want to see who you're depending on. Are you depending on King Trump or are you depending on King Jesus? I just want to see what you're going to do. I want to see what you're going to do when you you get out from out the, the voting booth. I just want to see what you're going to do. I want to see how you're going to handle this. How many of y'all know that I've come too far to stop trusting him now? I've come too far to turn around. My God has provided for me over and over and over again. He already knows what he's going to do. He's just going to see what you're going to do. What is your reaction going to be? Are you going to panic? Or are you going to be still and know that if God brought me through the 80s, if God brought me through the 90s, if God brought me to the 2000s, surely he's going to bring me through this. How many of y'all know that God is watching over his children? I once was young, and now I'm older, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed in the street begging for bread. Can I talk to you real quick? What I'm saying to you is why y'all tripping? If God did it before, he going to do it again. Why are you walking around talking about all I got is a little bit? That's all you need is a little bit. Can I talk to the people that used to pull up to pump five and say, give me five on five? Is there anybody in here that did not graduate summa cum laude, but you graduated? Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody that ever had to wash your drawers in the sink in college, but God still 
Israel made a way. I need somebody to stand up and say he'll do it again. I had every flavor of romaine noodles in college. But I'm here today to tell you that he can take some noodles and get you through a bachelor's degree. He can take $5 worth of gas and get you to work and back home. Is there anybody that can testify? Just put it in his hands. Y'all sit down. I can't see the people in the back. Watch this. It's time for us to sit down and strategize on this marketplace challenge. Watch this. He says, he says, Philip, what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do? He said, even if we had eight months, uh, he started doing math. If we had eight months, mm, that's still not going to be enough to feed 20,000 people, Jesus. Send them home. Jesus said, no, make them sit down. Look at, you remember when your mama used to get you dressed for church? She said, what? Now go in there and sit down. So. Some of y'all are running around frantically like a chicken with his head cut off because you're worried about the economy. You're worried about this clown getting in office. And you're running around, and I hear Jesus saying, sit down. I, I need some strategy. Sit down. Watch this. Instead of us looking at the current economic situation as people of color and panicking, we need to recognize and realize that the greatest resources we have is already within ourselves. With a trillion dollars worth of spending power, Lord have mercy. African Americans, if we ever realized how much resources we have amongst ourselves, we would Good God Almighty, sat down and began to strategize together. There's a young lady on TikTok, I don't know if y'all seen her, even after the election, she says, instead of us bemoaning Project 2025, let's come up with the black version of Project 2025. With a trillion dollars of spending power, what would it look like to quit going to Chick-fil-A and quit going to Home Depot and quit going to all these other businesses that have supported people that don't have our best interests? What if we took our own money and gave it to Jesus? and multiplied it in his hands. What would it look like if we came up, God, y'all ain't going to help me, with our own economic structures to spend money in our own community? I was talking to a black economist the other day, and she said what needs to happen is that we need to create direct pathways of economic empowerment to the motherland. Think about how much resources are on uh, the African continent. Uh, I, I met an apostle from Africa uh, earlier this year. He says, Apostle Spencer, I want to come to Memphis, and I want to be able to talk to the black business owners in Memphis because I have relationship with people who own copper mines and lithium mines and gold mines and diamond mines, and we are tired of doing business with Europeans who don't have our best interests. We're tired of sitting down in mythological Thanksgiving tables with pilgrims who just want to make us slaves. Do you have relationship? Y'all not listening. I'm talking some heavy stuff right now. Do you have relationship with some entrepreneurs in Memphis that can help us create direct pipeline, pipelines from raw resources to manufacturers who look like us? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Can I, can I shift from economics to spiritual transformation? The only way some of y'all are really going to grow and get what God has for you is you got to sit in small groups. He could not manage a crowd of 20,000. He could only manage groups of 10, 20, 50. When Jethro saw Moses tending to the 600,000 people he led out of slavery and taking them to the promised land, he saw Moses trying to deal with a whole crowd of people and listen to their concerns every day until sundown. And then Jethro told Moses, you're going to wear yourself out and the people out. Make the people sit down. Divide them up into groups of hundreds, fifties, and tens and take capable men that have the same anointing that you have on you and feed them in groups. I'm going somewhere. If y'all Y'all are going to grow at New Direction Christian Church. You can't keep hiding in the crowd. Real spiritual transformation takes place in small groups that we call connect groups. Because if we can get you connected with two or three other people who are touching and agreeing with you, that's where real miracles take place. They're not going to take place hiding in a crowd coming to church once a month. 
Real growth takes place weekly when we meet together in each other's homes, break bread, pray together, read the word of God together. That's where growth, make the people sit down. I want to challenge y'all in New Direction that if you really want to grow spiritually, you're going to have to find a small group and sit down somewhere. Y'all see how y'all be getting quiet. When I'm saying, oh, want to do it, he going to give it to you. Yeah. Y'all like, yeah. When I say sit down and get some, you're like, oh. Look at your neighbor and say sit down so you get your blessing. Sit down in a small group. Sit down with some people that can pray with you. It's time to strategize. It's time for us to build our own economic systems. Watch this, number four. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. I ain't studying y'all, man. I'm trying to help somebody. The reason we keep missing blessings is because we ain't sitting at the table. I'm trying to sit at some tables in this season. Shout out about. I'm trying to sit at some tables. The Bible says your gifts shall make room for you and bring you into the presence of great men and women. How many of y'all are ready to sit at some tables in this next season? Your gifts are going to make room for you and put you in the presence of great men and women. But if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Which means that the people that are sitting at the table are making plans for you. But if I'm sitting at the table, I'm included in the plan. What tables are God, is God putting you at this season that's going to shift it for the next generation? I, I got to go back to some. I got to go back to some real quick. Uh, what did they have? What kind of resources did they have? What kind of fish? How many was it? Two fishes. I'm educated. I know I ain't got no ES, but this is just for entertainment purposes. Two fishes. Five loaves. What kind of bread did he have? Y'all so smart. Why do you think the author distinguish barley from wheat. Why was that important to mention that detail? Can I help you? Because barley was the bread of poor people. It's like the booty end of the bread. <laughs> Have you ever made a sandwich with the butt end of the bread? <laughs> How many hate doing it? Tell the truth. If you ha oh, I'll be skipping over the, and then it gets down to that. You're like, Lord, I'm so hungry. So all they had was two butt ends of the bed, <laughs> two fish, and five loaves. Is that right, two fish? How many of you know that looks like it ain't going to be enough? And many of us are looking at our checkbook. Come on, I need somebody to talk to me. I need some real people. I went to super low because it was super low. Do you know how much groceries are right now? So I did not go to Kroger's. I went to Superlow because I was looking at my checkbook. And the way my account is set up this month, Superlow was it. How many of y'all in a Superlow season where you got to make a little bit go a long way? But here's the thing. You got to make sure you put your little bit in the hands of somebody that can make a whole lot out of a little. And many of y'all keep running to the wrong people, putting your limited resources in the hands of people that don't have the miracle of multiplication. Little becomes much when I place it, what, in the master's hand. Is there anybody that ain't got nothing left but a little bit? I know you're sitting around a bunch of rich people, but could I get some people that are in a season of a little bit to stand up on your feet and say, I got a little bit left. I got a little bit of money. I got a little bit of hope. I got a little bit of faith. I need you to high five your neighbor and tell them, though, you got just enough to make it. Because if you put it in Jesus' hands, he can take a little bit and make a whole lot happen. Can I get a witness? I pulled up to the gas tank and all I put in was a little bit. But I'm still driving. I looked at my bank account, paid all my bills, and all I had left over was.
was a little bit. But when I got up this morning and cut my lights on, I still had electricity. I still had some food to eat. I still had what I needed. Shake your neighbor's hand and say thank God for a little bit. Little becomes much when you give it to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is Jesus. Mary's baby. Bright and morning star. Bread when you're hungry. Water when you're thirsty. Won't he do it? High five three people and say all it takes is a little bit. A little bit of love is all it takes. A little bit of faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off and say all you need is a little bit. A little bit of faith. A little bit of hope. A little bit of love. A little bit of money. All I got is a little bit. Yeesh. Touch two people and say that's all you need. In this next season, you're going to miss the miracle of multiplication. If you're not seated, you got to be in it to win it. The last thing I want to tell you is thank God for leftovers. Oh, they all ate. Let her cook. Somebody said, let him cook. Let him cook. I, I turned my kitchen into a studio. Let me cook. Is there anybody in here that knows that when you put it in Jesus' hand, he going to let you eat? I just need somebody who's at the verge of graduating, Dion, and you're looking forward to sitting at the table. God says, let them eat. Good God Almighty. When I put it in the master's hands, he multiplies it a little bit. And what I thought I wasn't going to get, not only did I eat, but I ate real good. And I'm full. And I got some leftovers. I need some help up in here. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready to eat in this next season, in this next dispensation, in this next move of God. God's going to take your little degree. God's going to take your little checking account. God's going to take your little investment. God's going to take your little time. God's going to take your little experience. And God's about ready to multiply it. God's about ready to add number to digits behind your salary. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm walking in a season of increase. I'm walking in a season of elevation. I'm walking to a season of prosperity because I made up my mind that I'm going to put it in Jesus' hands. The rent will get paid. The mortgage will get paid. Student loans paid off. Good God Almighty, I feel a breakthrough in this building. Can I get a hundred of y'all and say, God, multiply it, multiply it, multiply it. High five three people and say, God, multiply. Multiply, multiply, the multiply. There's enough food for everybody to eat. Multiply. If he blesses your restaurant, he'll bless your restaurant. Multiply. The same thing he did for others, he's about to do for you. You ain't gotta hate me. You ain't gotta dislike me. You just gotta get like me. You're next in line for a miracle. High five your neighbor and say you're next in line. Last thing I want to say is thank God for leftovers. They all ate. Sit down. They all ate. Can y'all get that in your spirit? Look up and down your row and tell everybody on your row, we all getting ready to eat. Uh-uh. Kisa, y'all, they didn't get it. Sean, they didn't get it. I got to say it again. I said, everybody on your row getting ready to eat, and you're going to be full. I'm not talking about Thanksgiving dinner. I'm talking about your investments. I'm talking about your portfolio. I'm talking about your retirement. 
I'm talking about your kid's college fund. I'm talking about your investments. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, let's get ready to eat. You know what's crazy? Holy Spirit just gave this to me. Listen to me. Holy Spirit just gave this to me. They're eating under Roman occupation. They got an evil emperor that's ruling Rome. And the hope was that Jesus was going to be a new king. He ain't even on the throne yet. But they still ate. Somebody needs to know whoever's on the throne as king does not match who's feeding me. He prayed. Jesus prayed over the bread. Y'all ain't going to help me preach that guy. Jesus prayed over the two fish and five loaves. And he said, set the people down. He started distributing the bread, Lakeisha. He started passing out the fish, Lakeisha. And they all ate because Jesus had the nerve to pray over limited resources under Roman occupation. I don't care who's running the government. He's still distributing bread. We still gonna eat. I need you to make that declaration. We still gonna eat. For the next four years, we still gonna eat. No matter what it looks like, we still gonna eat. And have something left over. My 401k gonna be good. My savings account gonna be good. My trust fund gonna be good because I'm believing God for leftovers. Y'all ain't getting this yet. I asked Rhonda in the back. Y'all, y'all be see. Asked Rhonda in the back. So, baby, why leftovers be so good? Can somebody help me preach this? I send y'all on home. I need y'all. Let's, just, let's, just, let's have an interactive moment. Let's have an interactive moment. <laughs> Asia, why leftovers be so good? Because it has to marinate, the seasoning. Ow, why leftovers be so good? It has to marinate. The season flows on when, when, it, when it sits. It flows. When it sits and soaks. In the seasoning, it tastes better than it did when I first ate it. Oh, I'd be mad when somebody eat that last spoon of greens. I had my mouth all set on it because it's been marinating in the refrigerator, in the crock pot, under the ham hock. It's something about that last sp- Some of y'all need to thank God for leftovers because God says your ladder is about to be greater. I feel God in here. I've been letting your blessing soak. I've been letting it be in this season. I put some more seasoning in the stuff you've been waiting on. Somebody needs to understand that you got some leftovers you didn't even remember you had. Talk to me, God. Holy Spirit, talk to me. I'm reminded in Scripture when the disciples later on, after this miracle, they were sailing on the sea, and Jesus said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. And the disciples started arguing with themselves because they forgot to buy some bread. Jesus says, why are you arguing over the fact that you forgot to buy some bread? Don't you remember the leftovers we had from last week? You think I'm talking about bread. I'm talking about don't allow yourself to be infiltrated by the yeast of the Pharisees of people who believe in conspiracy theories and false propaganda. He said, quit watching Fox News. Quit watching CNN and get on your knees and open up your Bible because I've never abandoned you. I need you to hold on to your faith and don't forget the left 
leftovers from the miracle I worked the last time in your life. Is there anybody that can stand up and say, I'm still living off of leftovers? He blessed me when I was 12. I'm still living off of leftovers. He healed my wife. I'm still living off of leftovers. He healed my son, Jordan. I'm still living off of leftovers. Can somebody who's experienced the miracle of God step out in the hallway and say, thank God for leftovers? Can somebody give God about 10 seconds of praise and type in the comments, thank God for leftovers. I'm here today because of his love. Can somebody who should have died in an accident step in the aisle? Can somebody who had cancer but ain't got cancer no more step out of the aisle? Can somebody who made it through high school and made it through college step out in the aisle and say, thank God for leftovers? Shake three hands and say, thank God for leftovers. Can I help somebody? I am a leftover from Gloria Noreen Kimbrough. I am a leftover from Booney Spencer. I am a leftover from Sylvester Cage. I am a leftover from ancestors who are on the bells of slave ships. I am a leftover to remind the pilgrims that you ain't taking our land. We are about to get it back. Can somebody high five your neighbor and say thank God for leftovers. If you made it this far on leftovers, meet me at the altar and come and give God praise in advance for what God's getting ready to do. Bring your leftovers. Bring your two fists. Bring your five loaves and give God praise right here at the altar. Give him praise. Don't just look at me. I need you to praise him like you know a new season is opening up. A new table is opening up. Listen, listen. I just heard this in the spirit. Don't come to the altar if this ain't for you. But I just heard the spirit of God say, your table just opened up. If you heard me in the spirit, come and stand in front of me. Your table just opened up. I know you've been waiting, but your table just opened up. I know you never thought it would happen, but your table just opened up. I need you to have enough faith to walk down to the altar and decree and declare, that's my table. That new business, that's my table. That new opportunity, that's my table. That new contract, that's my table. That healthy relationship, that's my table. Healing in my body, that's my table. High five three people and say, that's my table. Can I pray with you? Everybody at the table, grab hands. Everybody in the lobby, grab hands. Everybody who believes that God's getting ready to do something miraculous in your life, grab hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we decree and declare open tables. God, you're about ready to allow our gifts and our anointing to make room for us. And we decree and declare that not only we're going to sit at the table, but we're going to get full at the table. And God, what, we, what happens, what transpires at this table is going to be enough to feed the next generation. The strategies that you're putting in place for economic empowerment, the strategies you're putting in place for African Americans to capitalize on their trillion dollar spending power is about to transform itself into, into, into streams of income for the next three generations. Father, what looks like, ah, shout out Abba, what looks like the fall of the empire is really the resurrection of your kingdom. 
And Father, I, I believe today that the remnant of people that are standing here with eyes wide open, the remnant of people here are still holding on to their faith, the remnant of people here who still believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, the people who voted for Jesus, the people who still believe in Jesus, the people who still have faith, the people who still have a little bit of hope left. God, would you encourage them today to let them know that you're about to bless them with leftovers? You shout out a book. Somebody say, I won't run out. For the next four years, I won't run out. Somebody say, for the next four years, I won't run out. Because the master will multiply my resources.